The eyes are not here. There are no eyes here in this valley of dying stars, in this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdom. In this last of meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech, gathered on this beach of the tumid river, sightless, unless the eyes reappear as the perpetual star, multifoliate rose of death's twilight kingdom, the hope only of empty men. A few years ago, I stopped talking about my work completely. I found that the process of trying to explain it to others got in, my, got in the way of my own attempts to understand it myself. But this is a TED talk, and I very much wanted to accept the invitation to be here. So I'm going to show you some of the images that I've made, and to go with them, I've stolen some words. Some, as you've heard, from T.S. Eliot, some from James Adji, from Tom Waits, from Herman Melville, and from Wim Wenders, and I've added a few of my own. All of this, I repeat, seems to me curious, obscene, terrifying, and unfathomably mysterious. So does the strange quality of my relationship with those whose lives I so tenderly and sternly respected and so rashly undertook to investigate and to record. So does the whole subs subsequent course and fate of the work, the causes for its exhibition and publication, the details of its printing and layout and design, the problems that confronted me as I displayed the photographs, and the problems which confront me now as I try to write of them. The question, who are you who will hear these words and study these photographs, and through what cause, and by what chance, and for what purpose, and by what right do you qualify to, and what will you do about it? And the question, why make these works and set them at large, and by what right, and for what purpose, and to what end or none, the whole memory of this country in its 2,000 kilometer parade and flowering outlay of the facades of cities and of the eyes and streets and towns and of the trembling heat and of the wide, wild opening of the tragic land wearing the trapped, frail flowers of its garden of faces, the fleet flush and flower and fainting of the human crop it raises, the virulent, insolent, deceitful, pitying and frenzied running and searching on this colossal map of one angry and futile, bottomless and botched, overcomplicated, youthful intelligence in the service of an anger and of a love and of an indiscernible truth. Taking pictures is an act in two directions, forwards and backwards. The photographer, likewise, is thrown backwards unto himself. A photograph is always a double image, showing at first glance its subject, but at a second glance, more or less visible, hidden behind it, so to speak, the reverse angle, the picture of the photographer in action. In German, there's a most revealing word for this phenomenon, a word known from a variety of contexts, Einstellung. It means the attitude in which someone approaches something, psychologically or ethically i.e. the way of attuning yourself, and then taking it in. But Einstelling is also a term from photography and film, signifying both the take as well as how the camera is adjusted in terms of the aperture and exposure. It is no coincidence that, at least in German, the same word defines both the attitude and the picture thus produced. Every picture, indeed, reflects the attitude of whoever took it. Yes, forwards a camera sees its subject, backwards it sees the wish to capture this particular subject in the first place, thereby showing simultaneously the things and the desire for them. If thus a camera shoots in two directions, forwards and backwards, merging both pictures so that the back dissolves in the front, it allows the photographer, at the very moment of shooting, to be in front with the subject rather than separated from them. Through the viewfinder, the viewer can step out of his shell to be on the other side of the world, and thereby remember better, 
understand better, see better, hear better, and love more deeply. He's just a little bitty thing, he's just a little guy, but women go crazy for the big blue eye. They say, how does he dream, how does he think, when he can't ever speak and he can't ever blink? How does he dream, how does he think, when he can't even speak and he can't even blink? We're all lost in the wilderness, we're as blind as can be, he came down to teach us how to really see. A curious and most puzzling question might be started concerning this visual matter as touching the Leviathan. But I must be content with a hint. So long as a man's eyes are open in the light, the act of seeing is involuntary. That is, he cannot then help mechanically seeing whatever objects are before him. Nevertheless, anyone's experience will teach him that though he cannot take in an undiscriminating sweep of things at one glance, it is quite impossible for him attentively and completely to examine any two things, however large or however small, at one at the same instant of time, never mind if they lie side by side and touch each other. But if you now come to separate these two objects and surround each by a circle of profound darkness, then, in order to see one of them in such a manner as to bring your mind to bear on it, the other will be utterly excluded from your contemporary consciousness. How is it then with the whale? True, both his eyes in themselves must simultaneously act, but is his brain so much more comprehensive, combining and subtle than man's, that he can, at the same moment of time, attentively examine two distinct prospects, one on the one side of him and the other in exactly the opposite direction? On the 23rd of August, 2004, three men, Christopher Sabidler, Luyanda Matomi, and Trevor Peterson, burned to death inside a single cell in Polesmoor Prison. Now, a single cell in Polesmoor Prison measures two by three meters, which is just enough room for three men to lie down, as I'm sure many men are doing in prisons in this country all around us. A few days after these men died, I went to visit their parents, uh, sorry, the parents of one of the men, Christopher Sabedler's parents. I went to Kailicha to their home to ask them permission to photograph the, f the funeral of their son. Seeing that um, I had arrived in a car, Christopher Sabedler's mother asked me if I would drive to the mortuary to take her younger son, the other son, to complete some paperwork and to identify the body. She also asked me if I would take a photograph of her son's body to bring back to her. I did both of these things. I printed the photograph, and for a couple of days, I wrestled with myself. I couldn't bring myself to bring this, this violent image, this image of a son's dead body burned to death to, back to the mother. But she had asked me to, so eventually I steeled myself and I drove back out to Kailicha. I took the photograph, I handed it to Mrs. Sabedla. She took one look at it, she kissed the glossy surface of the photograph. She pushed it to her chest, and she thanked me for helping her to mourn her son. I learned so much from this occasion. I learned so much about what a photograph is, the nature of the photographic surface, and also, of course, about the, the, the different ways in which we all relate to death. But recently, some years after this, I've been thinking back, back to this experience and back to how I represented it in my work and how I was in relating to the people there. And I realized that something had been excluded from, from, from all of that, and that was my own feelings. My own feelings of trauma from having seen this dead body and photographed it. My feelings of fear, my feelings of violence and anger, and as I say, trauma. I needed to write these back into my work, and this year I've presented a new exhibition called Retinal Shift, Retinal Shift and in particular one work I was looking back. We are the hollow men, we are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices, when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as wind and dry grass or rats' feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. 
shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom remember us, if at all, not as lost, violent souls, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men. Eyes I dare not meet in dreams, in death's dream kingdom. These do not appear. There the eyes are sunlight on a broken column. There is a tree swinging, and voices are in the wind singing, more distant and more solemn than a fading star. Let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom. Let me also wear such deliberate disguises, rat's coat, crow's skin, cross staves in a field, behaving as the wind behaves, no nearer. Not that final meeting in the twilight kingdom. This is the dead land. This is cactus land. Here the stone images are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. Is it like this in death's other kingdom, waking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness, lips that would kiss form prayers to broken stone? The eyes are not here. There are no eyes here in this valley of dying stars, in this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. In this last of meeting places, we grope together and avoid speech, gathered on this beach of the tumid river, sightless, unless the eyes reappear as a perpetual star, multifoliate rose of death's twilight kingdom, the hope only of empty men. Here we go around the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go around the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow, for thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent falls the shadow, for thine is the kingdom, for thine is, life is, for thine is thee, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang but a whimper. What if we could really see? So what I've shown you is how I've tried to see in the last eight years. And I'd like to leave you with a proposal, a proposal for all of us who want to really look at the world, and especially for all of us who want to represent it. It's a very simple thing. We need to three, see in three ways. It's a simple thing, but it's taken me eight years to understand it, I think. And the three ways are we need to see what's immediately in front of us with very acute eyes. And then, of course, as I've tried to do, we need to see beyond the structures, the political structures, the social structures, and the economic structures which hide much of the world from us. But what I propose, most importantly, is that we also need to look at ourselves and to write that looking of ourselves back into the way we look at the rest of the world. Thank you very much.